Hey, Form Fair. This is Ventrox. You might know me as a pink lad here at Form, and as the former co-founder of music streaming platform Wave.ac. I'm here today with my friend and colleague Noah Widener to discuss an important topic for a lot of artists in our community, and that's music publishing. Noah and I co-founded Wave AC back in 2017, and Noah's also done a lot of other work in the music industry, including working with Australia as a manager, songwriter, and vocalist, working with YouTube promotion channel EDMS on their record label, and helping to start Chill Beats Records, a fast-growing independent label in the chill hop and lo-fi segment. So we both have a lot of experience with the music industry. We'll get into what publishing is soon, but essentially this presentation is about how most independent artists aren't getting all of the money they are owed, and how to change that. Just a few notes before we get right into this. Firstly, this presentation is American-centric. Noah and I are both from the US, so we'll be focusing mostly on an American audience here, and while a lot of the information will still be valid outside the US, there are other additional considerations and different local organizations with which it might make more sense to register. I urge everyone, whether you're in the US or outside of it, but especially for our international viewers, to do your due diligence, do your own research, and make sure what you're doing is right for your specific situation. Secondly, this guide ranges from surface level to a deeper dive into these topics, but publishing is complex, and there's a lot we don't get into detail on here. You'll probably have questions at some points during this, and I encourage you to message me about any of your questions about publishing, since I'm always happy to help out independent artists with getting the royalties they deserve. If you're watching this live during Form Fair, feel free to post questions in the chat, and we'll try to help out. If you're looking to contact us or follow us, you can find me on Discord. I'm Vintrox, tag number 7138. And you can find me on Twitter at Vintrox underscore and Noah at Widener underscore. That's W-Y-D-N-R underscore. I'll also be linking some more detailed resources, uh, either in the description if you're watching this after, or in the chat right now during Form Fair, uh, that you might want to take a look at for a deeper dive into some of these topics if you have the time. This conversation is a mixture of uh, a call I recorded with Noah and some parts I edited in afterward. There were some issues recording the call, so I've tried to replace those when possible, but in some places there might be some audio issues, just so you're aware. It's worth starting here by discussing how music copyright actually works. So a copyright is what it sounds like. It's the right to copy something. And when you create a work, you generally speaking have the exclusive right to make copies of and perform certain things with that work because you are the creator of it. Now there are two types of copyright on music, not just one. One of them is on your composition. So that's the lyrics and the melody of a song. That's your songwriting. If you aren't making a cover song, if you're making an original song that you own all of the composition to because you composed it yourself, then you own that copyright. And there's also a master copyright. So when you record your song, when you make a, an audio recording of it, you own the copyright on that as well. And these are separate, they're distinct. You get paid for them separately. But I should probably also mention here how you get these copyrights. So you don't have to register a copyright to have something copyrighted. This is another thing that's a frequent misconception, is when something is fixed, when a work is fixed uh, to a physical medium of some sort, that is when you get a copyright. So if you fix your composition by writing down your lyrics or melody on a piece of paper or putting them on a computer, digitizing them, you have a copyright over that composition. When you record your song, that is fixing it into a sound recording. That gives you the copyright over that sound recording and the associated composition. So that gives you the copyright. You don't have to register it in order to own the copyright, but you do have to register it in order to do certain things, which we'll get into later. So when you put your song up on streaming platforms like Spotify, like Apple Music, you're getting paid through your distributor. Say you're distributing through DistroKid or Level. They are paying you royalties for the use of your master. That's the sound recording. What they're not paying you for is the use of your composition. Those royalties get paid separately, and if you don't know that you're claiming them somehow, you're probably not. So that's money that should be getting paid to you, but isn't. So what is publishing? Well, I guess that the best way to break it down is that there's like six different kinds of royalties that can be derived from the lyrics, the composition, and so on. A good place to start here would probably be to know what a publisher and publishing administrator is. As an independent artist, if you're recording your own songs that you wrote, so you created the composition, you created the melody, it's all your original content. So you are the songwriter because you wrote the song. You are the publisher, as in you are the owner of the composition copyright, and you are the publishing administrator by default, as in you are the person responsible for collecting all of the royalties associated with that composition. And that can be assigned to elsewhere. The publishing and the publishing administrator you can assign. You cannot assign someone else to be the songwriter because you are the songwriter. It's an important distinction that songwriter doesn't just mean the people that write the lyrics. Producers typically are songwriters and get nickel and dimed on 
on some of the you know money that is due them because people are like oh well i wrote all the lyrics but the composition and, and the elements that go into it technically in a very real way that is the melody and that is copyrighted as well even if you're not writing the lyrics that has a composition copyright that you can still get publishing royalties for so you'd have some sort of publishing split that's negotiated between all of the songwriters on a song as to what percentage of the songwriting royalties go to each songwriter and you're responsible for your own publishing so it's not like with a, a master where if you have three different people who work on it then you release through a label or a distributor or whatever whoever distributes it will pay out everyone, everyone's responsible for their own publishing administration by default when they work on a song. You negotiate the splits and then you're responsible for 20% of a song, you've got to deal with getting your own publishing royalties for that. If you don't, no one else is going to go out and do it for you. Songwriters can work with a publisher, so a publishing company, that will then take their compositions and they, they own the compositions that a publisher would own your your compositions just like a label would own your masters and then they'll pay you some split 50 percent say of the royalties that they get you can also have a publishing administrator so a publishing administrator is a company that uh, does not own the compositions but they work for whoever owns the compositions so if you don't want to deal with trying to get all these royalties on your composition yourself you as a self-published songwriter that is a songwriter who is your own publisher you own your compositions can hire a company hire a publishing administrator to go out, find all these royalties, collect them for you, and give them to you. Now these companies are very good at getting all of the royalties you're owed. They can go out internationally, they can work with all the collection agencies in all of these hundreds of different countries, and they can get all the money that you're owed, and then get it to you. So it eases a lot of complexity because you don't have to go out and do all this yourself, but the downside is that all of these companies will take some sort of fee. So one of the bigger ones, and one that I would recommend, is called SongTrust. So if you don't want to deal with things yourself, Song Trust might be a good option. What you have to do is you pay them $100 as a writer. If you've got multiple songwriters, say you were a three-member band, you've got to pay them $100 for each of your songwriters. And then they take a 15% cut on everything they get, and they pay out the rest to you. Now, if you register with a company like Song Trust as your publishing administrator, they'll basically handle everything for you, and you don't have to worry too much about everything else here. This information also still applies, but you don't have to go out and collect most of this manually, because they will do it for you. However, a lot of these royalties you probably could get yourself, especially if you're just getting a lot of royalties in the US, so you wouldn't have to pay that 15% cut. Whether or not the economics make sense of getting a publishing administrator depends on how much time you have to deal with all of this, how much you care about getting all the money that you potentially could be, and how much play you're getting in other countries. If you're getting a lot of play in other countries that you would have a hard time getting the money for on your own, it might make sense to work with a pub admin. If you don't have a lot of time and you don't want to have to deal with all this, it might make sense to work with a pub admin. If you don't mind someone taking 15% and don't mind paying $100 to get started, it might make sense to work with a pub admin like SongTrust. If these things don't apply, you might want to try to administer all your publishing yourself, which you can do, and I'll get into all of the different facets of that in the US right now. As Noah mentioned earlier, there are six different types of rights that are associated with your composition, but there are two of them that are responsible for most of the royalties for your average independent songwriter. And those two are public performance and reproduction. Let's start by talking about public performance. So what is a public performance? When you're in a restaurant, someone plays your music. When you're at a concert and your music is played there, if you're played on the radio, that is technically a public performance of your music. All of these different ways uh, referred to the way in which the music is delivered in a public setting, an openness, uh, more or less access that is relatively unrestrained by space. Streaming radio, TV, live music venues, restaurants, retail shops. One of the really interesting ones to note here, and one of the most important ones, is that yes, there is a public performance royalty from your song being played on a streaming platform. When your music gets played on Spotify, Apple Music, uh, Tidal, any streaming platform, you are owed a public performance royalty. So how do you get paid this public performance royalty? Technically, what you could do is go out and try to bill everyone who's publicly performing your song for the right to do so. But this is pretty much impossible. Are you really going to go out to every radio station, every live music venue, every streaming service, and try to get them to directly work with you? Uh, probably not. So what you essentially have to do is work with an organization called a PRO, a Performance Rights Organization. And what these organizations do is they get licenses. So they work with live music venues, they work with radio stations, they work with streaming services. And these services, these places, will buy a license. These PROs represent hundreds, thousands, millions of independent songwriters. 
and they have catalogs. Uh, so the two big ones in the U.S. are ASCAP and BMI. These are both public. You can join them, and they're nonprofits. Uh, there are two others. There's CSAC and GMR, which are both uh, private. You can only join them with an invite. So the important ones here are ASCAP and BMI that we're going to be talking about. But ASCAP and BMI both represent catalogs of over 10 million songs. And if you sign a contract with ASCAP and BMI, then you get a blanket license. That blanket license allows you the right to publicly perform any song in their catalog of 10 million or more. And you pay whatever the fees that they set are, and these contracts are all private. You don't know exactly what the terms are. Nobody can know them except for the person who's signing them and the PROs. But the PROs will collect that money, and then they'll pay it out to their songwriter and publisher members. What they do with radio is actually interesting, because they uh, don't listen to everything that's played on every radio station, because that would be incredibly impractical. So the PROs listen to samples of radio, so they'll listen to 10 minutes at a time of different radio stations or whatever, and then they'll pay out based on the streams that they hear then. What that means if, is if you're getting significant radio airplay, they'll probably pick up on the right proportion of it, and you'll get paid proportionally to how much you're getting played. If your song gets played just one time, then maybe you won't. An interesting thing to note about radio is that in the US, Unlike pretty much every other country, terrestrial radio airplay doesn't actually have any royalty associated with the master. So the recording artists don't get paid anything. The only way you get paid for terrestrial radio airplay, that's FM AM radio in the US, is through your PRO for the public performance right. Now their payouts for other things like TV and streaming and venues are different. So when you're playing something at, say, a concert, you might want to submit a cue sheet to your PRO that will then tell them what you're playing at that concert so they can pay out a public performance royalty for the play of your songs at that venue. Assuming that venue is licensed and is paying royalties, then if you submit the tracks that are getting played at that venue and you're playing your own tracks, say, at a concert or on a tour, then you can get paid a public performance royalty at, from licensed venues if you submit the proper documentation to your PRO. TV, uh, for TV productions, there are also cue sheets that are submitted saying what tracks are being played on TV, so the PROs know. For streaming, the exact documentation on what tracks are played gets submitted by the streaming services to the PROs, so they can pay out exactly. And those rates generally end up being, for streaming services, something like 6-7% to of the revenues. For the master, it's more like 53%, so that's what you get through your distributor. But 6-7% to of that it comes in as public performance royalties that are paid by your PRO. Now, the way that PROs pay out their funds is also really interesting. So first what they do is they take all the money that comes in, and they take a cut off the top for their operational fees. I've seen numbers anywhere from like 11 to 18%, we'll call it something like 15% that they take off. After that, they split everything 50-50. 50% goes to the publisher, 50% goes to the writer. In most cases, everything goes to the publisher, and then they split it based on their split. Uh, but the PRO does that themselves, so you're guaranteed to be getting 50% as the songwriter, no matter what, whatever your publisher does. Now, it's worth noting to split it by type, so if you get played on a radio station, you're getting paid a percentage of what that radio station paid to your PRO. If you get played on streaming, you're getting a percentage of their streaming revenue. If you get played in an event venue, then you're getting paid a percentage of what that venue paid in licenses. So they're not giving streaming service play the segment of their radio revenues and uh, uh, vice versa. One last topic before I talk about how to collect these uh, international public performance collections. So most PROs have what's called reciprocal agreements in place. These are agreements with foreign PROs under which uh, they share information and they share royalties. So if your music gets played internationally, then the international PRO will collect international public performance royalties and forward them to your PRO, and your PRO will do the same for international uh, songwriters. Now these agreements don't always work out perfectly, sometimes the data is a little messed up, sometimes things get really slow, it'll take like six to nine months for your revenue to arrive. What can make it a little better is working with a publishing administrator that can directly register your tracks with these to make sure that all the data is perfectly accurate and you're getting paid for everything, but as an independent self published songwriter, the best you can do is just register with your PRO, and you should get a decent amount of international public performance collections at least. So how do you start getting your public performance royalties? This one is not actually that hard. This is probably the easiest part of publishing. What you have to do is you have to register with a PRO. So in the US, that means your options are ASCAP and BMI, because they're the only two public ones. Now ASCAP costs $50 as a writer to join and $50 as a publisher. In order to get your 50% writer share and your 50% publisher share, you have to join as both. So it'll cost you $100 to register with ASCAP. For BMI, it's actually free to register as a writer. And the thing about self-published songwriters with BMI is that you can collect your publisher share without registering a publishing company. So that means my recommendation goes to BMI, because you can collect your publisher share, that's 50%, and your writer share, another 50% 
with only one free registration. So it's completely free to register with BMI, and whether or not you get the same amount from either one, we don't really know because, again, their contracts are private. But as far as I can tell, you're going to do just as well registering with BMI as you would with ASCAP, and it'll cost you less and doesn't require registering as both a publisher and a writer if you are self-published. Your choice to affiliate with one particular performing rights organization or another is probably a matter of region and cost more than anything. No one wants to pay any upfront costs to join a pro, if at all possible. At least for me, that was the case. I joined BMI, and after joining BMI, I was, you know, privileged enough to receive four royalty disbursements per year. And, you know, they're not like a massive amount of money because a lot of independent artists don't really get performances from licensed venues um, and applicable collections. But in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter because it's money. And my personal experience with BMI is I get paid money by them every once in a while, which in the grand scheme of things for the amount of work I did, that's fine. You know, the amount of money that I get is fine. It's acceptable. It's due diligence to make sure that you're getting every last dime that is due you as an artist because the worst case scenario is that it ends up in someone else's pocket because black box royalties and God knows what. Another thing that's worth noting here, if you work with a publishing administrator like SongTrust, they will only take their cut off of your publishing cut. So you'll still get your entire writer cut paid directly to you. So that means if SongTrust takes a 15% cut, it's effectively a 7.5% cut on your public performance royalties because they're only taking their cut on the publisher's share that they register. Now, you'll need to register with a PRO whether or not you work with the publishing administrator, so make sure you do that. Another thing to note here is that when you do register, you need to register all of your compositions. So that's all of the songs you've written. If you've written a song and then you've recorded different versions of it, you only register the one composition, not every recording of it. You can probably put in the ISRCs you get from your distributor for every recording to make sure they collect the revenue, but you only register the composition once. Now, if you work with a label, you should check and make sure in your contract that they aren't doing your publishing. Some labels will publish for you, some labels don't have any publishing terms in their contract. If your label's doing publishing, then they're collecting these royalties, the publisher's share at least, already. You should be able to get the writer's share no matter what, uh, so make sure that you're registered properly and that everything goes to you with your label so you can tell them the information about your registration with your PRO to make sure you're getting that, but you don't want to register your tracks yourself necessarily unless you're sure that you run your own publishing. Some labels don't do any publishing, in which case you still own 100% of your composition and you can get 100% of your publishing. So make sure that you register all of your tracks with your PRO, and if you don't have the right to register those tracks because they're, someone else is publishing them for you, make sure that you're still pro associated with them properly at your PRO, so then you're getting your publishing cut, your 50% writer cut, directly from your PRO. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about mechanicals. What, is a, what, what even is a mechanical, bro? Mechanicals are the other big part of publishing royalties for most independent songwriters. So mechanicals are part of the right of reproduction. You get paid a mechanical royalty whenever your track is reproduced in some form and distributed. So this could be a physical reproduction or a digital reproduction. So that could be a digital sale, that could be a physical sale on CD or vinyl, that could even be a stream. This all gets paid a mechanical royalty. So where does the name mechanical come from? It doesn't really matter, but there is a backstory to it. Mechanicals come from the idea that there used to be like physical like presses or physical like, I don't know, physical manifestations of the written work on paper or on phonogram. Jeff Price says it has to do with player pianos. It came from the automatically playing pianos where they'd have like the note cards. So what is a mechanical royalty? Now this is something that's really interesting because the process for mechanicals is established by the U.S. government, by statute, by the U.S. Copyright Royalty Board. So this is a group of judges that sets the statutory rates for mechanical licenses. So there are two ways to get a mechanical reproduction license. One of them is the compulsory license. So this means that unlike with most types of copyright, you are obligated to give anyone who asks a license, assuming that they follow all of the rules. You can also have a direct license in which you negotiate your own terms outside of the statutory system, and you do whatever you want. But there is a compulsory license, and this is what a lot of people use, because, uh, especially for independent writers, there is a process that is specifically in place that allows you to get this license. 
Now, technically, right now, in order to get mechanical royalties, you do need to register your copyright. This is one of the two things that you need to register a copyright for. One is getting mechanical royalties. Technically, you don't really need to in some cases. Uh, and the other is getting statutory damages if you're planning on suing someone for copyright infringement, which I'm assuming most of you are not. Uh, but the way that mechanical royalties work for physical and digital phonographic sales, so this is a permanent sale of your song, is that there is a royalty of 9.1 cents under the uh, compulsory license, or 1.75 cents per minute, whichever is larger, so over five minutes it'll actually be more, and this is paid to you as the publisher, or your publisher if you are not your own publisher, uh, for the reproduction of a sound recording embodying in composition. Now, the way that this actually works isn't that important, because if you're recording your own songs, in the US, all of this gets paid directly to you. For digital sales, it goes through your distributor, actually, and so you or your label would be responsible for paying it if someone else was the songwriter. Uh, for physical presses, again, it's whoever is selling it is responsible for paying that, and all the money goes directly to them for these digital and physical permanent sales. So if you're covering a song, or someone else is covering your song, then you've got to figure all this stuff out. But if you're making your own music, then you're actually already getting these because they're coming through your distributor. Where this gets more complicated is in mechanicals for streaming. Now in streaming, you still do need to pay a mechanical royalty for the reproduction of the sound recording and body and composition. So streaming services, Spotify, Apple Music, and so on, need to pay you, or your publisher if you aren't your own publisher, a mechanical royalty every time they stream your song. Now, these can be, again, either done via a direct license or via the compulsory license, and the compulsory license rates for streaming are set via a very complicated formula set out by the Copyright Royalty Board. Now, these are in the Code of Federal Regulations, section 385.21. I've read this entire thing, I know exactly how the uh, rates work, but it's a complicated formula, and I'm not going to go into it here because I don't have the time. So I'll simplify this by saying that the mechanical royalties generally come out to about the same as your public performance royalties. So that's another 6 to 7% of a streaming service's monthly revenues. Now these vary by month, but just for as an example, the April 2020 Spotify United States mechanical rate was 200th of a cent per stream for ad-supported streaming and 600th of a cent for premium streaming. Now that's not the only complicated part about streaming mechanicals. What's even more complicated is how you collect these. So for the next five months, and it's the next five months because this process is going to change very soon under a new law, the way that this works for a compulsory, not a direct license, is that the streaming services are responsible for finding and paying the publisher. Problem is, streaming services usually have no idea who the publisher is. They know who's giving them the master, they know the label because they're getting that through your distributor, but they don't know who the publisher is, they don't know who the songwriters are necessarily, so they can't easily find you and pay you. So what they do is they don't do this themselves. They hire a third-party company that works as basically a back office administrator to figure this stuff out for them. And they hire, there are two companies that do most of this. One of them is HFA, the Harry Fox Agency, and the other one is a company called Music Reports. It's important to note, these companies do not work for you as a songwriter or publisher. They work for the streaming companies, and the streaming companies pay them and give them all the data to attempt to figure out how to pay mechanicals. Now, these companies are actually not very good at their jobs. There are a lot of people who have had issues with them not paying, with them having unreliable data, with them just being generally bad at doing what they're supposed to. And the other thing about them is that you can't register, you can't give them your data so they can find you unless you have an actual publishing company. So it's basically really hard to directly get your U.S. mechanicals right now. There is a company that can do this for you. Uh, it's a company called Audium. They do two things very specific things. One of them is YouTube Content ID, and the other one is United States and Canadian Streaming Mechanicals. So what they do is they can get back mechanicals for since like 2011 or something, and they can get your future mechanicals, and they take a 30% cut of back mechanicals they get, and a 20% cut of future mechanicals. And they work for whoever the uh, publishing administrator is. So if you are your own publishing administrator, you don't hire a company like SongTrust to do this for you, then you can work with Audium, and Audium will go out and find all of your mechanical royalties in the US and Canada, not internationally outside of those countries, and get them to you. If you work with a publishing administrator like SongTrust, that's another way to get these. They will figure all of that out for you. 
Now this is how you can get US Mechanicals through Audium or a publishing administrator. International Mechanicals, you basically need a publisher or publishing administrator to do that for you. It's very hard to register with all the International Mechanical Collection Societies because the processes are completely different in every country and often very expensive to register and set up for. So if you have a lot of international plays and you want to get Mechanicals for them, you'll probably need to get a publishing administrator or publisher to do that. So here's why I said this is relevant for the next five months, not permanently. The United States, in the year 2018, passed a law called the Music Modernization Act. You might have heard about it. It's a pretty big change. So what the MMA did was a few different things, but one of the major ones is what it does is it essentially eliminates the existing compulsory license system for streaming and for digital royalties overall, so that's uh, including uh, digital download, and it replaces them with a blanket license system in which a provider, essentially in kind of in the same way that they would with a PRO, acquires a blanket license to uh, reproduce any song ever in existence. So this one agency that's created by the US government essentially called the Mechanical Licensing Collective gets paid the mechanical royalties as defined by the Copyright Royalty Board. And then a provider who has that blanket license then has the right, according to the US law, to reproduce uh, the compositions embodied in any sound recording ever. This doesn't get rid of the compulsory license system that exists now for physical presses, but for digital presses, everything is going to move to the new MLC system, which will allow them to obtain specific mechanical licenses for a blanket license for digital distribution only for a fee paid directly to the MLC. Now the MLC will then pay out everyone uh, so kind of in the same way a PRO will. They collect and distribute royalties, they maintain databases of compositions, they match the sound recordings and compositions, and they pay out songwriters and publishers. So the MLC pays out to a publisher. If you're self-published, then you can register with the MLC, unlike with Harry Fox right now. Self-published songwriters will be able to register with the MLC when they open registrations in a few months, probably. So if you want to administer your own mechanicals, you don't want to work with someone like Audium or a publishing administrator, keep an eye on this, register with the MLC when you can, and add your catalog, and that's going to be how you get your mechanicals. Now you have to do this sooner rather than later, because if you don't collect your royalties within three years, they're going to get paid out to the major publishers, which makes no sense because the major publishers are pretty much all direct licensed. But anyway, that's where your money goes. They go to the major publishers and songwriters by market share, not to independent artists who aren't getting them. So make sure that you're getting your mechanicals somehow once the MLC starts. Whether you register with the MLC, you register with Audium, who will figure everything out with the MLC for you, or you use a publishing administrator. The MLC will start operating in January of 2021, so make sure that by that time you get all of your stuff registered if possible somehow. It doesn't matter how you do it. So I'm running out of time here, so let's get through another few things really, really fast. One, Sound Exchange. Sound Exchange is sort of part of publishing, but not exactly. What Sound Exchange does is they pay out digital royalties for your masters, not your compositions, when they're streamed on digital radio of some sort. So that could be Pandora or satellite radio or any. Uh, non-interactive, as in you can't choose what songs you play, streaming services that are digital. So this is not for FM and AM radio, which still only pay out for the composition. This is for the master royalties on digital radio. And sometimes these will get paid through your distributor. So you might be getting this through your distributor. But registering for sound exchange is free. So if they happen to have money for you, you might as well go and check that out and make sure that you're getting everything that you could be for your masters. So this, it doesn't matter if you have a publisher. This would be, your label would do this if you have a label. But they will pay you out, potentially, if your distributor isn't doing this already, for certain digital radio and non interactive streaming royalties. Number two, print and synchronization. These are often smaller sources of revenue for smaller independent artists, but they're important nonetheless. Print revenue is for your lyrics or printed copies of your composition. So if you're making sheet music, that has to be paid a print royalty on your composition. If you're making lyrics distributed online through platforms like Apple Music's uh, or Spotify's Lyrics View, uh, through any other online lyric service, uh, if you're making any, any sort of printed or digitally printed copy of your composition, there is a royalty that's owed on that, and in some cases you can uh, work with services to distribute those lyrics as a publisher or a publishing administrator and get paid for the print use of your work. If anyone's making physically printed copies, again, they're going to need a license for that. And these terms are basically whatever's negotiated. It's an open market. There's also synchronization. Synchronization is a part of reproduction. It's a part of the right of reproduction. Now, synchronization is when you associate a uh, sound recording that embodies a composition and a video. So, for example, if you're making a music video or you're putting it with TV or something, uh, this requires a synchronization license, and synchronization licenses, whether you're doing it for TV, for advertising, for music videos, uh, requires uh, a license 
and anyone who wants to use your music with a video needs to get that synchronization license. Now these are also an open market. You can charge however much you want as a publisher for a sync license. Now they also need a license to the master. So they'll have to pay your label or you as the uh, owner of that master for a master license as well as you as the publisher or your publisher for a synchronization license. Uh, there are agencies that can handle sync for you and help you get sync opportunities to get some of these revenues. Uh, I don't have any specific recommendations as far as that goes, but it's important to note that synchronization licenses do exist. Another thing with sync is that if you're playing it, say, on TV, like an advertisement, that's also public performance, so you're going to get public performance royalties through your PRO for that as well. And finally, covers and remixes. So there's a little bit of a gray area between remixes and covers. In some sense, a cover is really just like a complete reproduction of an existing composition um, for new master. A remix is usually an unsanctioned, unlicensed commercial release, um, and you can't send these to stores. You can't send someone else's work to stores if you built upon elements of the original master recording. This does not apply to authorized remixes. If the, if the original label or the owner of the master gave you the authorization to make that remix and to distribute it, then you can. But unauthorized remixes, you cannot distribute without permission, unlike covers. Creating something completely new through a cover song and then distributing that by securing a cover license is completely acceptable. And though you won't be able to claim publishing royalties and mechanicals and pro royalties, you will be able to claim the royalties from the stores for the plays that you are getting. Um, there are a number of services such as Sounddrop, which does distribution for cover songs, but also for most artists, uh, DistroKid offers an option which allows you to pay a little bit of extra money to secure a cover license and it's just a blanket license that allows you to uh, release the song that you have recreated or covered and uh, collect royalties on the actual master for which you produced. So the way these cover licensing services work is they handle all the mechanical royalties on things like digital sales and unlicensed streaming services that do not get those mechanical licenses directly. Stores like Spotify and uh, so on will handle all the mechanicals and public performances normally, uh, but if you're selling on something like iTunes in the US, again, those mechanical royalties you have to deal with paying, and these services do that for you. So that's all we've got time for to go over right now. Uh, thank you for being here, and I'm going to go over everything really quickly just as an overview of what the lasting takeaways you should have from this are, and what the actions you should start taking right now to get all of your royalties are. Uh, but if you have any questions because I didn't explain anything really well, uh, please just send me a message or post in the chat if you're watching this live. Uh, so here's the summary of what you should remember and do to get your publishing royalties. If you're not already affiliated with the PRO, do that. My recommendation is to affiliate with BMI. Uh, then your decision that you need to make needs to be whether you want to work with a publishing administrator or to continue handling your own publishing. Uh, this is again a cost trade-off and a time trade-off and an international streaming versus domestic streaming trade-off. I'm not necessarily shilling SongTrust. I think a big benefit of SongTrust is that they're registered with pretty much all the major pros and organizations and artist representative agencies. SongTrust will already be working with the HFA. We're going to work with MLC. They already work with many of the um, like artist societies um, and pros for collections. So. The really good part about Song Trust is that you really don't have to do a whole lot of work to get mechanicals and to get paid for performance royalties and a limited amount of other royalties, which you might get paid. But a downside is that there are upfront costs to registering as a songwriter and a commission. It's cool if you like want to save yourself some time, if you want to relax and, and leave it to someone else, that 15% might you know be the cost of your time. The, I think the $200 that it cost me to sign up for me and Trevor. But uh, yeah, I would say I would say that we've had a positive experience and payouts are very quick. And in many cases, they will also tell you up front, is it worth signing up with Song Trust? On their website, there's like a thing that you can go on there and you can put in all of your songs that you own and it will calculate um, how much money you'd make a year in mechanicals and performance and in assorted royalties. Um, and that alone was a reason for me like to be like, oh, cool, I think I'm going to jump on this.
If you decide to work with a publishing administrator, I recommend registering with SongTrust. Uh, register all your songs with them that you have the rights to do so. Is make sure that you're not under a publishing agreement with a label, and that's all you need to do. If you're doing your own publishing and you want to collect mechanicals, you have one option right now, which is work with Audium, and they will go collect your back mechanicals and your feature mechanicals. Or if you don't have all that much in streaming right now and you don't care right now, then you can wait a few months and register with the Mechanical Licensing Collective to get all of your mechanicals starting in 2021. I also recommend looking into registering with SoundExchange. They might have some revenue for you, they might not, but it's worth a try and it's free. As far as anything else relating to publishing, if you want to check out me and Noah, you can see our social links on screen right now. You can go to my personal website, vintrox.music.ceo. You can follow Noah on Twitter at wydnr underscore.